So the story is that a vicar went to a primary school one day, and the children were, the primary school kids were learning the Apostles' Creed. And so they all stood up in a line, and they all had their different sections memorized to impress the vicar. So they started saying the creed and coming down the list until how, at one point, however, there was an embarrassing silence. And eventually, with only two kids to go, nothing was being said, and the one child finally blurted out, I'm sorry, the boy who believes in the Holy Spirit isn't here. <laughs> well, when you talk about the Holy Spirit, particularly in a Presbyterian church, there can be an embarrassing silence. Some sayings happen, like in the Catholic Church, where they say Catholics believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Mary. Sometimes in Protestant church it says we believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Book. We even get a little uncomfortable when we go into the traditional language of the Apostles' Creed and say we believe in the Holy Ghost. And when you start talking about speaking in tongues, everyone seems to get a little antsy and awkward and uncomfortable. But Pentecost Sunday is a great day and a celebration for all of us. It's when the Holy Spirit descended onto the disciples. It's uh, 50 days right after Easter, which is the Penta portion of it, the Pentecost. And of course, it's marked in red, which many of you got the e-blast to celebrate. The, the red symbolizing the tongues of fire. The, um, even the blood of the martyrs and certainly is a popular day for us for baptisms, for confirmations, for installations, just like we're doing today. I love how the old time preachers used to say, Pentecost is when the church became the church. So let's have that in mind as we read the very familiar text, Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. Listen to God's word to you. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native tongues? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke, 
The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord God, what a special privilege it is for us to pray. To bow our heads out of reverence for you. To be thankful for the opportunity to claim your word in our lives. Your Holy Spirit indwelling in us. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> Last year, many of you know that we took a Highland group to Ireland and to visit uh, Doug and Elaine Baker, the missionaries who we support, who will be retiring in a year. And while we were there, we had some great experiences almost every night. We would, we would go to a pub or two, dozen, and sometimes we would even have a sing-along with people because everyone was singing all the time in these pubs. And it was just wonderful music. We don't have that environment here. It's kind of a sport bar type of an environment. You're watching a sport on TV. And I started thinking about that, that even in America, there are a few common tunes that we all have in our own American repertoire. Of course, there are some that everyone in this room knows that every single national sports event, we sing the national anthem. Say, can you see? Come on. By the dawn's early. Thank you, John, for standing up. Wasn't that nice of John Shetram for standing up? Thank you. Now, on Monday night, if you really want to be on the best committee at Highland, you need to be on the worship committee. This is a, a, a commercial because we went to the Barnstormers and had our committee meeting there. And so talk to Dr. Rothiger if you want to join us. But, of course, we have another song that we all know, and that's the seventh inning stretch. Through the ball game, through the ball game, take me out to the... We know that one too, but even more popular than that is one that all of us know. We sing all the time, and it's a little tiny song, Happy Birthday. Happy Birthday to you. Okay, stop. All right, that's good. That's good. You know that one. Four simple lines. Three of them are the very same. That's why we have it memorized, right? But it's the most universally recognized song in all the world. Do you know where it came from? In 1893, Mildred Hill and her sister Patty, a Kentucky kindergarten teacher, they created this song, the original composition, but it actually had different lyrics. It was actually called Good Morning to All because the sisters hoped that it would be a cheery way for the children to start their day in kindergarten. Well, early in the 20th century, someone thought up the words, happy birthday, and the version became an instant classic. And although it's, it started here in the United States, it actually is world-renowned and in hundreds of languages. But the song was copyrighted by Warner Chapel Music, who had bought the rights from the original publisher. Now, did you ever wonder why when you go out to whatever restaurant you go to, that they have not in the past several years been singing to you, happy birthday to you? Do you know why? Now you do. It's copyright. And so you hear all these other kinds of songs, like the song that Dee Dee and I learned when we were waiters and waitress at the court and Shall I come over here and sing it with Dee Dee? Shall I? <laughs> Kings and queens and princes too want to wish the best to you. Wish day, wash day, what do you say? Birthday, happy birthday to you. Thank you, thank you. Get a hand for my wife here who's uh, been with me. I need that tuxedo, Steve. Thanks. Man. 
No, 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 don't take it off, please. No. But last fall, last fall, the copyright expired for happy birthday. Warner Chapel tried to renew the copyright, and there was a district court judge in L.A. that wouldn't let him do it because they said you shouldn't have gotten the copyright in the first place when you changed the words. So now, happy birthday can be sung by everyone in any restaurant because it's now public domain. And since Pentecost, you wondered where I was going, right? <laughs> I would have too, but uh, I wrote it, so I know where I'm going. So Pentecost is the day the ch Christian church also entered the public domain. And since Pentecost is widely regarded as the birthday of the church, and since it was on Pentecost Sunday, 58 years ago, in 1958, that Highland was chartered, I thought it'd be appropriate if all of us sang happy birthday to the church. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to the church. Great birthday. Great birthday to Highland. That day I checked on that. It actually was a Pentecost Sunday. It's on May 25th, but it was Pentecost Sunday in 1958. So it's our birthday celebration. Until Jesus' little band of disciples had experienced the descending dove, the tongues of fire, the ecstatic voices of different languages, they weren't ready to go public. <laughs> They certainly weren't spreading their faith all over the world. Until Pentecost, their faith was more proprietary. It was more private. It was not so public. But after those remarkable events of Pentecost Sunday, their good news single became a worldwide hit. You see, Pentecost is the third biggest celebration of the Christian year, running far behind Christmas and Easter in popularity. These other two religious holidays have been like platinum albums to the secular culture. We have secular Christmas, which is blatant consumerism that we go out and buy thousands and thousands of dollars for the ones we love and for other people as well. Secular Easter is almost like a rite of spring now. No one has trouble finding decorations or greeting cards for that Christmas or that Easter. They come complete with their familiar, familiar mascots of Santa and the Easter Bunny right on your front lawn, blown up. Those symbolic figures have high name recognition, including millions of people who have never darkened the doors of a church. So what happened to Pentecost? Why isn't there a secular Pentecost? There are certain things that you never ever see in relationship to Pentecost. Have you ever seen a rack of Pentecost cards in a drugstore? Or have you ever savored a special Pentecost candy? How many of you make Pentecost cookies? Do you think the church will ever need to issue the anti-secular call of keep the Holy Spirit in Pentecost? Not likely. I don't think it's going to be a problem anytime soon. There is no secular Pentecost. Nobody's trying to hijack our rights to Pentecost. Pentecost is ours alone with its power-filled, life-changing message our job, we just got to be open to the winds of the Holy Spirit. Think about all that Pentecost Sunday offers us. The significance of the Holy Spirit as wind. That essential breath that seems to be the very life force 
of life itself as, as God breathed in life to human beings in Genesis. The Spirit is fire, the source of warmth and light, but more than that, a vital force whose very nature is to consume and transform all that goes before it. That fascinating detail of how the disciples are miraculously given the gift of comprehending other languages, God breaking down the barriers between nations and cultures, the way the Holy Spirit lights a fire under the disciples, how there was a unique mix of combustible materials on hand causing the church to explode into the Roman Empire, eventually burning its way to the very palace of the Caesars. The Pentecost miracle could easily have not happened at all. After Jesus' ascension takes place from, from, from rising up to the heavens, as Luke tells us right here in Acts 1, what after that? What if? And who could have blamed the disciples if they had simply turned around and returned to their homes? If, they, if that had occurred, the gospel message would have remained as if under copyright. A quirky tale that meant a great deal to the disciples, but would have had little impact on the rest of the world. Were it not for the miracle of Pentecost, the church might never have become the church. But after the roaring wind and the tongues of fire, everything is different. The disciples have now become apostles and they've been sent out into the world. The good news of God's love in Jesus Christ becomes a bestseller around the whole world as if it has become public domain for everybody. On Pentecost, we're celebrating the birthday of the church, which began almost 2,000 years ago. Now, some people think that Pentecost is a, that Christian faith is a little personal, individual thing. And yes, each of us has our own little faith story and, and based on our own spiritual experiences. But after Pentecost, our Christian faith, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is to be public domain, available to all God's people with whom you come in contact. We aren't meant to hum our hymns under our breath. We are meant to shout them from the mountaintops, to take the message of God's love in Jesus Christ and let it echo off the walls of the cities and the towns wherever the winds of the Spirit blows you and me all over the world. As theologian Emil Bruner famously remarked, the church exists for mission as a fire exists for burning. This is why Pentecost is such a symbolic day for ordaining and installing officers for the sacrament of baptism. It's a new day of spiritual rebirth, revival, and renewal. It's a new day for commitment, dedication, and devotion. It's a day of celebration, commemoration, and remembrance. It's a day when the church becomes the church, which it was called to be. So let's celebrate Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's don't allow any embarrassing silence in our lives. No, no, sir. We want to share with other people the faith that the Holy Spirit will empower us to say to others to be bold in our faith in who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ is. And that we might have leaders, elders, and deacons, and trustees who, we, who will be bold in their faith, prayerfully discerning God's will and the decisions and leadership that they make. And that together, here at Highland, that we will experience a Pentecost revival, all for public domain. So happy birthday, Highland, and happy birthday to the church. Amen.